Hello, Romantics. I'm Sarah Gomez, author, romance lover, and host. You're listening to Romancing the Story, a podcast centered around writing, reading, and story structure, all with a twist of romance. We're at episode 60, and on today's episode, I speak with Catherine McClatchy about reassessing goals for seasons of life, how identity influences goals, and tracking time to understand how much of it we really use. Catherine always provides great recommendations for books to help understand how we can work to become our personal best, and the resources mentioned in this episode are listed in the show description. There are also links to connect with Catherine and her podcast, Authorpreneurs Unleashed. I do use Amazon affiliate links for the books, so if you buy through the link, it helps the podcast and is greatly appreciated. I felt like this was such an important episode because not only is this a follow-up to our episode from about six months ago, but we have both embarked on different stages of life since then. As Catherine's plans got delayed, to moving across states, and me and my family took full custody of our foster kiddo. After hitting some of my goals this year and completely neglecting others, I'm reminded a bit about how Catherine and I chatted about giving ourselves grace in episode 42. I'm slowly learning to pause or let go of overwhelming myself to the point of burnout and lowering this exceedingly high pressure I put on myself. I hope doing so makes space for new opportunities without being crowded by tasks that no longer align with my goals. If you're experiencing a new season of life, unexpected changes, or just lowering overwhelming pressure, remember to be patient with yourself. You've got this. With that said, let's jump right in. My goals, again, reassessing is good because nothing worked out the way it was supposed to. I mean, same. I mean, it just kind of went like crazy. So like, it's just, it's it's always funny how we kind of like go, like you have to kind of reassess those goals. Like, and you were talking about like monthly or even quarterly or, and since we're at that six month mark around that. Yeah, that's a great time. And actually I just converted to a new bullet journal and exactly it's the three year. I, yeah, I talking about goals and dreams, right? It starts with dreaming and that's where I'd love to start our conversation. What's the big dream? And do you dare to dream big enough? Oh yeah. Yeah. Because that's where I find that I'm kind of at now I'm at this like precipice of like taking my dream to the next level. And it's like, how am I going to, how do I set myself up for success for that? Mm -hmm. Because I have like, I am just getting inundated the podcast stuff too. I'd love to do that. And like in the midst of all this other stuff. So. Right. Right. Yeah. So there's a whole new aspect of time management that you've got to deal with. The smartest thing I did with my boys was they each had a Google calendar and linked to my Google calendar so I could see all their stuff. Ooh, I might have to do that. Yeah. And and it got to the point, if I had to be responsible for something, it had to be on their Google calendar. If they didn't write it in, mom was not responsible because we are not doing wake up in the morning and oh, by the way, I need 30 cupcakes for school. It, It really worked well. And, and mom and dad had to play too. So the boys had access to our calendars and we Mm -hmm. had access to theirs. So they, when they're making plans with friends, they can see, Oh, mom and dad have this going on. I better not schedule something there. Or mom and dad are out of town this weekend. Why don't I spend the weekend at your house? And then they won't have to find a family to take care of us, you know? So by the time they were 13, 14 years old, they were pretty cool about working with our calendar. You know, it's not just us. It's just we have an extra one. Uh, and you're getting thrown in at the deep end because you didn't have the time, you know, to do the whole baby thing and ease them up in, in that way. So mm-hmm. welcome, probably our favorite guest around here with digital media strategist, consultant and author Catherine McClatchy. Yay. 
Thank you so much for having me back. This is my happy place. Yeah. And like, it's like, you're the only guest now who've done four times. <laughs> oh, had I'm so podcast. honored. I'm so honored. I love it. Yeah. And I, I hope at least if you haven't caught an episode with Catherine that you definitely catch up, but in case listeners don't know, can you tell them a little bit about yourself and your business? So I am Catherine McClatchy and I am the owner and operator of Unleashing the Next Chapter. We are a boutique digital marketing agency catering specifically to creative entrepreneurs. Most of my clients are writers or somehow involved with the writing community. I am also a writer. Uh, we also host a writer's uh, group and podcast. The podcast is Authorpreneurs Unleashed, where we focus on the business of writing. We just are slow rolling into a YouTube channel, which will deal more with the business of being a creative entrepreneur. So that would include folks like artists and musicians and theater people and craftsmen, uh, people who are focused more on their craft than running a business, but they still want a business, right? So uh, we try to help them through coaching, through done for you and done with you services. You say that because I've seen so many, um, especially creative minded people, not just authors, but like you said, kind of like theater people or or um, other craftsmanship, just mm -hmm. kind of like go out and start speaking and like either speaking your gigs or like um, creating classes for the library or their local community or guesting on podcasts like a lot of people on here have. And mm -hmm. like they just have the most interesting backstories and like they're trying to use that as like a point for their business. Absolutely. I, I think it's a great thing. And I think we've entered a place in our culture with social media that we want to see behind the scenes. We want to know how things are made. We want to know, you know, the, the struggles and the joys behind the finished product, right? I actually started marketing by being voluntold by my parents to go hang flyers. Um, my dad was a stained glass artist and he built some of the most amazing stained glass pieces. He did church windows. He did custom things for restaurants. He did restoration projects. People would bring him things that they found at auction two and 300 years old to rebuild and then put in their homes or businesses or whatever. And he wanted to do stained glass. He loved working with people. He loved teaching stained glass. But the whole idea of doing marketing no, you're not interested. So fortunately, I showed an early knack. And while I was in high school, I started marketing for my dad's business. My mom had a bookkeeping service. So she did the, the money stuff and all the numbers. And I did the words. And I think that's what started me down this path. I love working with people who are creative and focused on their craft. My craft, I love needlework. I love, I, I've sewn, I, I made more money in college for my sewing than anything else. And I also, you know, love being a writer. So I've seen the community grow and the fact that both communities, being it artisans or authors, they have the same needs and the information that they get from the social media gurus online aren't appropriate for those type of businesses. We live in such a interesting world now when everything's so accessible. Mm -hmm. So like, it's easy to kind of start your own little small business or kind of launch yourself out into the world. Right. Yeah. We're like giving a peek behind the scenes. I do love falling into those like little, um, shorts or the TikToks of like how, like the day in the life of just like, I don't know why, but carpet cleaners really like carpets all nasty and it's really old. And it's like a hundred years old and it's been a family heirloom, but then they right. get it all nice and pretty. And like, I just love watching the process. Yeah. Of it. The, the house flipping that oh, gets me yes. or the people there, there are a number of folks online that go find clothing either at Goodwill or something like that. And they take it apart and rebuild it. I, I can lose a day easily just watching all those videos. You know, and it's so interesting. You look at the, some of the comments, cause I always look at the comments afterwards mm -hmm. and they're always like, oh my gosh, where's your business? I, I have something for you. I'd love yeah. to either buy your product or I'd love for you to do this for me, like right. do the same thing for me. The thing I've noticed is that most of us who are creatives 
are also DIYers at heart, right? Mm. And we think we, we've been on social media for 10, 15 years. We can do our own social media marketing. You know, we've, we've spoken at whatever. We can do public speaking. We can do our own branding. Um, but the thing is, those areas change so rapidly and the best practices and the strategy for a business purpose is very different than getting on Facebook and keeping up with friends and family. And that's where my heart goes out. And that's why I offer done with you services as well as coaching and consulting, because yes, everybody, if you are smart enough to write a book, if you are start enough, smart enough to, you know, build a business, you can absolutely do all these things. But let's, let's teach you best practices so you're not wasting your time doing things that won't get you the results you want. And also, you know, if I can coach you, you can learn in a year what's taken me 30 years to master, right? So I just think it's it's about time management and priority management. Just because you can, does that mean you should? Speaking of time management and priority management, uh, that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you more about because my time has gotten so much smaller than what it was before. Because, you know, we talked uh, last time we talked, we talked about goal setting back all the way in January when like we have all these new shiny goals and we're just like, okay, I'm going to do the thing. And here it is. But then we're kind of at that six month mark, um, give or take. And you're kind of, reassessing. We talked about reassessing goals and now mine have shifted very much because I have full custody of a kiddo. Now I need to fill out my Google calendar and figure out how to fit in all the things. And sometimes I don't have time to try to learn the hard way through social media or building more of my podcast business, because I know definitely a turning point right now for my podcast where I can really run with it, but find where that works best within what time I have currently. And it's been six months. So I do not remember exactly what we talked about, but I'm thinking this would be a great place. Listeners, if you didn't listen to the January episode, maybe pause this one, go listen to that and come back and see how things have changed. Because I think there's something to be learned from that too. You know, we can make great plans and I firmly believe we should make plans but we also have to know that life happens beyond our control and you just got to roll with the punches well exactly and when i started out in january i had been a foster mom but i had a couple of kiddos with me and that totally shifted from Mm -hmm. like the kiddo we got current custody of and that and so it's a whole new dynamic it's a whole new kind of set of needs that we're trying to work through and try to figure out and we're, I'm just trying to meet both their needs and ours as well. And like trying to see like, okay, where does the podcast fit in all right. this big puzzle? And then you have a full-time day job on top I of do. that. And oh my goodness, I would like to write something because that's my happy place. I know, exactly. August timeframe. So holidays are right around the corner. And I don't know about you, but holidays usually get a, real, a little bit crazy around here for us. I'm just trying to figure out, okay, what is the status of my goals? Because I've hit some goals. Some goals have rapidly changed from where they were. Some of them have completely fallen off a cliff. The good (laughs) news is that that is 100% normal. You know, I have talked to so many clients that feel like they're failures because they couldn't make their goals happen. And then I ask them, okay, so what did you do in the last six months? And then we compare that to their goal sheets. And those things weren't even on the sheet, but they're really cool new things. And I I think that's why I'm sure we talked about last time setting quarterly goals rather than the 12 month goals. I've done a lot of study. The, The whole year long goal thing that started out with the industrial revolution that started out with companies needing to get financing from banks. They had to set their their list of goals so they could get financing. Um, but the fact is, we now live in a much faster paced world. What used to be in the 1800s, a solid 12 month plan, our 12 months don't look the same as theirs because there's so many more opportunities and there's so many more things happening in that. And technology is changing so fast. You know, when you consider five years ago, there wasn't even TikTok. 
Mm -hmm. We hadn't heard of a lot of the things. How many people changed careers multiple times in their lives in the 1800s? That never happened. For that matter, in my parents' and grandparents' generation, they never changed careers. We, we have to look at our planning and our goal setting in a very different way than maybe we were taught to as we were growing up. There have been so many like goals that have reprioritized for mm-hmm. us, like, and things that weren't, like you said, weren't even on my radar before. So it's very interesting when, when you're going about, like you said quarterly, cause that was something I do remember talking about. I actually re-listened to our podcast not too long ago to kind of prep for our interview and discuss it. Cause I was like, oh yeah, we talked about monthly goals and quarterly goals uh-huh. and kind of a lot of that ended up shifting. Cause I, I did set like a six month goal mark. Now I didn't hit a lot of those six month goal marks, but like some of the big ones I have absolutely achieved that I wanted to, like things that I had made for like a couple of years down the line or maybe even a year down the line, I had achieved those. How do you go about reassessing those goals at like, say we didn't do them quarter quarterly or the month, like maybe I didn't do that. And I'm looking right now at six months and saying, okay, how do I reassess the goals now where I am? For those who haven't done thorough goal setting in a while. Um, And even for those who have, I think you start back at not so much what do I want to do, but who do I want to be? I have been learning a lot about identity and identity crisis over the last six months. And so many people that get frustrated and lose their way because they feel like they're not doing what they set out to do, come to find out they're tying what they do with who they are a little too tightly. So if you can take a step back and reevaluate, who do I want to be when I grow up? Not associated with a job. I want to be a lifelong learner. I want to be a compassionate servant. I want to be the joyful mom. These are, this is who I want to be, not what I want to do. So once I'm solid on who I want to be, and and I I say this tongue in cheek, if you're listening, I'm 54 years old and I've got gray hair and I've got 30 year old kids, right? But I think there's something in all of us that still wants to level up and be better than the current version of ourselves. And things happen in our reality. As we've talked before, I'm a six time stroke survivor. I didn't have any control over my life flipping upside down and having to be reinvented in my thirties. Right. So, but who I am was solid. I've always loved learning. I've always loved sharing what I've learned. I've always wanted my, my home to be a place of peace and joy. Those things are solid. So when life seems to go off the rails and I have to reevaluate, I look at the things on my list and are they still important to me? Is doing these things still going to help me become who I intend to be? Or are these things no longer important in my current situation? As a stroke survivor going through rehab, I had to sit my boys down who were teenagers at the time and figure out, you know, we can't do Christmas like we've always done Christmas because mom literally can't. So Mm -hmm. tell me three things that are really important to you. If we do nothing else, what three things do you want to do? I sat both of my sons and my husband down around the dinner table and we had this discussion. And when they handed me their little slips of paper, not one thing that I thought was important for Christmas was on any of their lists. I was all about the baking and the presents and the big gifts and Mm -hmm. all those things that I thought was important for them. And they wanted to go to church on Christmas Eve. They wanted to have a big family dinner. They, the only gifts that were on their list was the Toy for Tots Angel Tree thing that we had done every year. And I thought, you know what? Mom's off track here, but I did a decent job raising my boys. So we focused Mm -hmm. on who we are as a family and we reprioritized our goals based on that. So just an illustration to get people thinking. It's not so much what you're doing, but who you're becoming. Because I remember the last time we talked, we talked about the why. Like, mm-hmm. don't forget your why. And mm-hmm. 
the identity thing I've heard so much about lately is like, I've been reading it in different books and seeing different like talks about it, discussions about like, you need to align like your goals or priorities with who you are at your core, because then that makes it, you know, it it makes it almost like unconscious that you want to do these things, you know, as opposed to like pushing yourself to do it. Like, I believe it was James Clear. We talked about that last time, James Clear on the Atomic Habits. I've been rereading that again. And he mentioned that, that it becomes this, it, once you shift that identity, it isn't like this draining um, piece of the puzzle that you have to do these things. It's just, that's just who you are. Of course, I'm going to run a business. I'm an entrepreneur. Of course, yeah. I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to try to grow my business by maybe, you know, getting a consultant like you, Catherine, right? So like that's to like re- help me reassess what, where I can manage my time and what I can do, because that's just an investment into my business. So Dr. Maya Shanker, Maya, M-A-Y-A Shanker, S-H-A-N-K-E-R. She is a PhD who specializes in identity. And uh, she was on the Andrew Huberman podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it was really interesting hearing her talk about a lot of this and give examples of both clients she's worked with as well as her story. And again, I think the reason now she's been delving into identity for decades. This is nothing new for her, but I think we're hearing so much about it right now because the pandemic kind of flipped a lot of things upside down. It made a lot of people reevaluate who and what they, who they want to be, what they want to do with their lives. You know, I, I keep hearing business owners talking about how they can't get anyone to work. Nobody wants to work. You know, we're having an issue where I live with restaurants being closed multiple days a week because they don't have enough servers to staff them. And Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that comes from the fact that people realize they could work from home. They could work from this for themselves. And they really don't want to go someplace where they have to punch a time clock and do things that don't fulfill them. I think that's changing both uh, the business owners who can't get staff, their world is changing by that nature. And then those who've come to that realization, we're also seeing in the news, a lot of businesses that are trying to get people back in the offices and people are like, nope, I'll quit. Sorry, don't need to do that. I think we're we're hearing a lot from the corporate side, at least, and from the academic side about identity, because we as a planet we're just thrown into this situation where we all had an opportunity to sit at home and either eat chocolate cookies and ice cream and watch bad TV, or we were, you know, reevaluating what we want to be when we grow up and how we want our families to, to be. So I, I think now is the perfect time to be having this conversation. Cause that's something that I've been kind of trying to realign of like who who I am at my core. And it's so funny because I do talk to several authors, especially debut authors who also tell me that like at their core, they've always loved been a writer. Right. Mm -hmm. And they, but it was things like lockdown that really got them thinking, if I'm going to do this, I better do it now. I, I need to do this and I need to make the time to do it. Something I know that you've done too is like you have like a business. Don't you have a business, uh, business goals and personal goals, like two different types of goals. Yes. Right. Should you focus on identity when doing both of those goals? Uh, That depends upon how closely intertwined they are. Mm, You know, there's some who in the bucket list. Oh, yes. And Morgan Freeman's character had spent all these years as a postman, maybe. Um, It was something that, you know, you had to be reliable and you had to be good at your job, but it didn't take a whole lot of brain power, right? And Jack Nicholson's character was jet setting and building these huge corporations and all this thing. Um, but the the thing was, Morgan Freeman's character, he was a historian at heart. He loved reading. He loved researching. He loved writing. So he purposefully took a job that was rather boring, but had good benefits to support his family. And so his mind could be active doing the things he really was passionate about doing. And we see that historically, a lot of writers, a lot of the Victorian writers, you know, were clerks and bankers and uh, bartenders or whatever, because then that gave them the freedom to do what they were passionate about on their own time. So there, there's that dynamic, you know, if you have a job that pays the bills and supports your family, but allows you the freedom to do what you want to do, well, then those goals need to be somewhat separated, right? One is in service to the other. But then there's others of us who 
my passion is marketing and helping others tell their stories. I have come to the understanding and I am cool with it. It's not false humility. I will never be a best-selling author. I'm okay with that. I love to write. I'm an adequate writer. I am not going to win awards for my writing, but I can help other storytellers get their stories out to the people who need them because marketing is my strong suit. Who I am is not so much tied up as being a marketer, but the two of them are so interrelated that I have trouble separating the two. So a lot of my goals, and now my son has come into the business with me. uh, So the family goals are also somewhat lining up together with my personal goals. Taking a very brief break from the discussion to mention my guest, Catherine, is a digital media consultant and strategist and happens to run her own digital media business. She's currently open for new clients. If you're looking for coaching or consulting in digital media strategy, brand strategy, content marketing, email marketing, or social media marketing, she is a fantastic resource. I'll let her tell you a little bit more about what she can offer. We had talked about how we're reassessing our goals. So in January, when I set my goals, I intended to move in April. That did not happen because the state of Arkansas just changed their licensing practices and became a compact state. Big story there. What we thought would take four to six weeks for my husband to get licensed ended up taking five months. So he is now officially licensed. He has a new employer. He is getting credentialed on the insurance boards and maybe come November, we might be moving. So that changed all of my plans for the the year. Everything I had set out for the year anticipated we were moving in April. So all of my client contracts, I ended in March. So I would have time to focus on moving. And um, now guess what? I have no clients. So if you are interested in working with me, I am definitely looking for two clients and I would love to either work as a done with you, a done for you type of service, or just coaching and consulting. Um, And if you are an author who has a background in business and would like to talk about that on the Authorpreneurs Unleashed podcast, I'd also love to talk to you. And now back to the show. Well, and when we talk about reassessing, because I know more of my time now has gone more in the personal goals. Mm-hmm. How do you, how do you kind of balance that? Well, that's also a season it? of life, right? That's true. <laughs> um, you know, the, the thing is when my kids were teenagers, I did this crazy thing. I went back to grad school <laughs> and I was working full time and I was a GTA and I was doing the Um, the mom thing and the little league thing and, you know, the church thing. And the doctors say that didn't contribute to my strokes, but I'm not convinced. (laughs) I mean, I was truly burning the candle at all ends. So I think there is a thing about understanding that as women, we've been told we can do everything, but what they neglect to tell us is that honestly, we can't do it all at the same time. So what is important to you in this season of your life. Being a mom and getting your your new one settled, that obviously needs to take top priority. Your family is going through a time of transition. It's a good transition, but it's still a time of transition. And if you don't pay attention there and make sure that gets settled very well, then there's going to be problems down the road that are going to distract you from your other goals the first thing, you know, look at your season of life. What can you realistically do? The other thing is look at your calendar. I spend so much time with clients and I get caught up in this too. I have all these things on my agenda, all these goals, all these dreams, all these uh, things I want to do, things I believe I should do, things people are telling me I should do. If you look at, you know, on this planet, we get 24 hours a day. And if we sleep eight of those hours, that means our weekly time is 112 hours. You get 112 hours to figure out you have to sleep, you have to eat, 
you have to feed and clothe and dress your, you know, shower and all those things. Driving to and from work, if you do that, you know, look at how many hours you have. Because when I took my goals and I took my tasks and the projects I had committed to and I started putting them down on my calendar, I needed 170 hours of discretionary time to fit all that in. No wonder I was exhausted in kind of half-assed doing things, right? So um, I think it's really important not only to reassess uh, what's important to you, but how much time do you really have to commit to what you want to do? And then you got to look at priorities again. You have a lot of people kind of telling you what you should be doing, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's from like social media or like family, friends or something else, or just like the, you know, oppressive nature of being a woman. Sometimes mm-hmm. we put it on ourselves, <laughs> to be honest. Right. And then count in those of us that have a cycle, you know, there's a week out of the month, most of us are not at our best selves. So, you know, put that on the calendar, you know, figure out your your body clock, figure out your family situation, figure out, you know, where those things lie before you commit to things. And just because some social media person tells you you have to post every day, you do not have to post every day, period. End of story. It's about figuring out what is most important to you and which tasks are going to get you closest to your ultimate goals. And if your ultimate goal for this season of life is being a mom, that's what you need to focus everything else around. And if you have extra time, then you put in some of those other things. If you're an empty nester like I am and you have way more time free to do what you need to do, well, now's the time I'm pulling out some of those dreams that I didn't get to 20 years ago and I'm reevaluating. Are they still relevant to the person I've become? Well, and you're integrating new dreams too, like you were saying, like you were starting to figure out a goal for for you and your son because you said you guys wanted to work on a project together. Yeah. Uh, My eldest is extremely creative. He's had some of his own challenges with mental health and uh, neurodivergence, but he is brilliant on so many levels and he is so creative and he, he has a heart that he likes seeing other people happy and fulfilled. Mm. So we have, uh, we started out co-DMing a D&D game and realized how well we really work together. I took a truck ride, he's a long haul trucker. I rode with him in January and we had a fabulous time and came up with some other harebrained ideas. And he has since come on to unleashing the next chapter as a help with he's learning social media he's learning marketing but his strong suit is editing he loves video editing so we've figured out some things that we would like to work towards uh maybe it'll happen maybe it won't but i've also learned over the years if you don't have big dreams to work towards they will never happen so i always keep you know a 10-year dream this mm-hmm. idea that we all got to start somewhere. It's, it's okay to start small. It's okay to like, if you learn something and you have to scrap and then restart again, you know, there's no shame in that. So. Unleashing the next chapter started out as a, wouldn't it be cool if while I was in stroke rehab, I had come, I had done, my first degree was in marketing. I had worked in marketing for a number of years. I changed over to academics and teaching literature and research and those kind of subjects, composition, rhetoric. Then when I stroked, I had to reinvent myself. And it just started with, you know, if money, if time, if uh, ability was not on the table, what do I want to do? And going back to the core of who I am, I've always loved Victorian literature. And I always thought, wouldn't it be cool if I was one of those wealthy landed Victorian gentlemen who had all the time in the world to read and write and think new ideas and dream new dreams and experiment with his property, you know, what's to stop me now? I'm, I'm not a Victorian gentleman, but I had all the time I can read what I want. I can write what I want. I can uh, have conversations with people I want. And what started as a blog in 2012 for unleashing the next chapter, documenting my stroke recovery and reinventing myself has now become a marketing agency. But there is always new technology. That's Mm -hmm. the thing. 
Like even exactly. chat, like chat GPT wasn't even uh, on the radar, like about a year. Well, it kind of was like, I know some people had it on their radar, but, um, but wasn't really a thing until earlier this year. Right. So my sec, my third stroke, I was rehabbing the month that Facebook became a public thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Facebook started out for university students and it was a very small intranet kind of thing. And then when it went public and the rest of the world could get on it, my rehab therapist, uh, occupational therapist said, you know, I've heard about this thing. It might help you since you can't talk. Let's start working hand-eye coordination and see if you can start typing messages to your family members through this thing called Facebook. So, you know, that wasn't, but what, 16, 17 years ago, I just had my 17th anniversary of my first stroke. There, you know, those things when I went to college the first time didn't exist. Because I think I remember having this conversation actually very recently on my Instagram because I had talked to, um, yeah, Carolyn yeah. Choate. We had talked about blog tours because we were talking about podcasts, but we were, uh, since the, we were talking about that, that could be the new blog in, in a lot of ways, but like the blogs are still around. So I asked my audience, I was like, does anyone still do blog tours? But there were several people out there who yes. still do blog tours. This goes back again. If you're getting your social media wisdom advice from the influencers because they have a gazillion followers and you think they know what they're doing. Yes, they do for their industry, but their industry isn't filled with readers. Mm -hmm. If we are authors and our target audience is readers, doesn't it make sense we should be blogging? Well, and demographics are different. Even if we do have a, like a like there's another author out there that you follow like via TikTok or shorts or any of that or YouTube or even a podcast. And you say like, well, I'm going to kind of do what they do. Obviously they, you know, there is, you know, their demographic might be different than yours. Their like demographic, I've, their voice, their, mm-hmm. um, uh, their goals, their time. I've kind of opened myself up to, to different types of topics and things like that. Cause I do love to learn. That's basically who I am at my core is that we talk about identity. I love to learn and I love to hear about all these stories that people tell me. And, and like one thing I, I kind of opened myself up and then I learned, I had so much of a wider reach than I ever thought. And that's, I think what we need to focus on as far as goals, like where are our strengths? Cause a lot of times that will tell us who our identity is. But had you not focused in on a target, you wouldn't have gotten the the rest of the bullseye, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I keep reminding people, if you try to attract everybody, you will fail and attract nobody. If you go for a certain target, you will likely bring in, because there's a, a trickle effect, right? Or a ripple effect. You will bring in the group surrounding your target audience, but you have to aim for something. And that's why the goal setting is so important. That's why knowing who your target audience is, is important. And that's why ag- accurate branding is so important. I kind of fumbled for like the first, I think, six months to a year with my podcast because I had no idea what what exactly that identity was. I kind of had this vague idea, but it it did. It, as you talk about a bullseye, it did. It kind of started out really wide and then eventually mm-hmm. siphoned down to that one target. Yeah, that's really common. When I and, and when I started turning unleashing the next chapter into a marketing platform. Um, I was really surprised that my demographics ended up being very different than who I thought they were. I had been a college professor. I really loved working with the the young 20 year olds and the 30 year olds, those who were, you know, starting new adventures and their lives were transitioning. And I really thought that's who my target audience would be. And it turned out that my target audience is about 10 years younger than me to 10 years older than me. And I'm finding as I'm working with a lot of clients, uh, their target audiences are about 10 years older than them on average. So that Mm. has been real eye-opening. Even those that are writing YA and they think they're writing for teenagers, when they look at their demographics on social media or on their newsletters or whatever, they're finding they're closer to their age, if not 10 years older. But that was something that has surprised me as I've kind of gone along this journey of the podcast of figuring out who my audience is and what they're looking for exactly. Mm -hmm. And what I find 
works well within like my identity as far as, as far as like what goals I need to set as far as the podcast goes, because I feel that once I have that in line, everything else kind of falls into place a lot easier. I, I won't share names or anything, but I have had several people reach out to me that were completely like different from like authors. They really weren't authors. Mm-hmm. They were more business minded people. Mm-hmm. And I, and I appreciate that, but I, I asked myself recently, I was like, what kind of value did they bring to me and my audience? Like, I'm very interested to hear their story, but I just don't feel like it aligns with who, with the kind of the product I built. Right. Right. I'm doing the same thing with entrepreneurs unleashed. So my, my podcast is by authors for authors. So if you have not published something and I don't care what genre or, you know, format that looks like, but you need to be a writer of some sort and have some type of experience or skills with some type of business. Those are the parameters for my podcast guests. And I keep getting hit hit up by people who either they're authors, but they have no business expertise or experience, or they're people who have the business expertise and experience, but they're not authors. So they can't relate it back to the author community because honest to goodness, our challenges are significantly different than most other small businesses. Yes, it may make sense and in like a cursory look of like, okay, they know a lot about business. Maybe they can talk about marketing and I talk about marketing on my podcast, but like, but does it really relate to what I'm trying to bring? And I'm always trying to bring this base knowledge of like, what can I learn to this to create my own path as an author? That's always what I keep as my center for the, for like always having a guest on. That that's wonderful because we need something to filter it through, right? There's just too many opportunities and too many ways for us to get distracted and off of our path. Um, so having a way to filter that is useful, but it's also, you know, knowing who you're, you are at your core and knowing who you want to be is essential, but that can also take different roads too. Mm -hmm. So the podcast is very much by authors for authors, but I also have a YouTube channel that is for creative entrepreneurs and it demystifies business for creative entrepreneurs. It's not specifically about writers. And at this point, I haven't done any guests on there. It's just been me kind of sharing uh, group coaching sessions and, you know, things that I think creatives need to know. So I started out the um, Unleashing Writers Community as a Facebook group for, I think, three years. We had that Mm -hmm. and I did weekly group coaching sessions for the members. And I am a teacher at heart. You know, even when I was doing corporate before I did the the second career, um, I always ended up doing corporate training or productivity management or, you know, something along those lines. So this this has always been natural to me. And when I could share my screen on Zoom and show people, you know, it's a very different medium than if you are in front of a classroom, right? I've done, I've, I've spoken to thousands of people. I'm comfortable doing those live events as well, but I can't share my screen and, and show them where the mouse is going and click here and do this. And the reason we do this is because, and here's a new software tool that's come out, you know, so I'm finding I'm loving YouTube because it allows me to share the screen and share these different applications and these different tools and these different ways to streamline the business side of being an author. Because we all have different tools we use, right? To mm-hmm. achieve the goals that we're trying to to achieve. And I know, I think we talked about that as well in our, the last time we chatted about setting goals. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes those tools look a little different and it doesn't matter what they are as long as they work for you. If they work for you. So there are so many tools that are intuitive to us and not intuitive to us. So Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of folks who love Trello. For whatever reason, it just never clicked for me, but I can make Asana work with no problem. And I can teach Asana. It's it's just a different platform. It, It just clicks with me. I think the same way, you know, for your note taking apps, a lot of people love Notion. Notion does a lot of things. You can use it for productivity. You can use it for project management. You can use it as a note taking app. I don't 
jive with it. It's it's not my happy place. Evernote, I've been on Evernote since, I don't know, 2013 or something. Um, Evernote just works for me. So I keep up with all the tools and I try them all out because I want to be able to advise my clients on what might work best for them. And I wanna make sure I can help them learn these things, just like all the different email marketing platforms. You know, I play with MailChimp and MailerLite and ConvertKit and uh, Substack and, and all the things. I try to keep up on that because that's what I bring to my clients. If I know all the options, I can better help you figure out what was gonna work for you and save you all the time experimenting with all these things. Because, you know, playing with these tools are my happy place. <laughs> It is about like finding the right tools that work for you. Like you said, some of it is intuitive and some of it's not, but some of it might make sense. Like if they, right. if it's kind of, if it goes hand in hand with what you enjoy doing or something that you wouldn't even think necessarily, again, goes back to your identity of who yeah. you are. Cause yeah. I'm a writer. I love to write. So I love something physical. So like, mm -hmm. I always love a planner. Like I have my Google calendar, but I love a planner, like just a okay. good, like nice thick planner that I could just highlight yeah. and put stickers in. <laughs> yeah. And, so. and see, that's the thing. And the bullet journal. So I was telling you before we started, you know, I just, my new bullet journal, uh, we just migrated, but I, when I first started bullet journaling, I had been amazed with the art journals. And then I saw people combining an art journal and a bullet journal. And I thought, Ooh, that's cool. And I spent a lot of time trying to do that before I realized, you know, that's just not me. I, I can appreciate somebody else doing it. I gave it a good shot. But the fact is, I like color and I use washi tape, uh, you know, to mark my stuff, but I don't need to do all the artsy stuff. Um, but I also am very much into digital, digital tools. And I think there's a place to use both. You know, some people are very much in the analog camp. Some people are very much in the digital camp. And then there's a lot of us that have seamlessly blended them together and find a system that uses both. And I think it's important to recognize that just because something works for whoever is your guru uh, doesn't mean it'll work for you. And that's okay. There's enough choices out there. You can figure out what works for you. Same for goal setting, since that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, just because one goal setting technique works for somebody or um, in, in the Christian community, you know, getting up and having a daily quiet time before the sun comes up, you know, somehow there's value in that for a lot of people. I am not one of those people. And I spent a lot of time feeling guilty that I couldn't have a prayer time, you know, first thing in the morning. Well, quite honestly, I don't want to talk to my husband first thing in the morning either. I am not a morning person. <laughs> But um, if you have a need for prayer in the middle of the night, I'm your girl, you know, because I'm probably up. <laughs> and what research has found, we've talked about chronotypes before because, you know, yes. I'm, I'm really fascinated by this. And, and it's a DNA thing. You can take a cheek swab and find out your chronotype. Um, so it's not just, you know, if you are lazy and don't want to get out of bed. No, you're probably not a morning person. But what they show is that there are a lot of us that if we exercise first thing in the morning, and that's not our chronotype, we're more likely to in get injured. And we're more likely to have problems sleeping. So depending upon your chronotype, that determines when your optimal time is to exercise. That is so important to know, like some of those things as far as like, yes, the, the knowing your chronotype or knowing what kind of person you are, because I know we talked about that in the last one too, about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I was kind of, I said more like, uh, I'm not really a night owl. I like I sit somewhere in the middle and I, I get most of my product productivity done in the morning. So that's why I too hate to go out to work out because that mm -hmm. eats into the productivity time. Cause I'm mostly that's like your prime time aired and ready to go. Yeah. In the morning. And I do my hardest tasks first. Cause I know that's where I'm going to get my biggest benefit. I am the exact opposite. First thing in the morning, I am doing things that take no brain power. That's when I throw in a load of laundry. I wash my dishes from the night before in the morning uh, because the morning's just kind of brain dead time for me. I am not functioning, but tell you what about the time. And I used to get, my boss would be so annoyed when I was working corporate because they're packing up to go home at five and I'm just rearing up, ready to go. <laughs> you know, um, I was the one who was coming in at the last possible moment in the morning being totally non-productive, but being 
between five and seven, I can get a full day's work done. Utilizing your time in that way too, as that tool, like knowing where you're where you sit as far as like getting your productivity done or, <laughs> or yeah. what kind of person you are, that can help a lot. I think too, as far as like, uh, like we were setting a like goal setting and things like that. So where you can get your chunks of time or what you can yeah. do in those times. Yeah. And it also, again, but it's still influenced by your seasonal life, right? Because if you've got kids that you've got to get out the door to school at a certain time, it doesn't matter if you're a morning person or not, you got to suck it up and figure out how to do it. Um, You know, when my kids were at home, I couldn't be up all night writing or doing, you know, what Mm. I wanted to do because I had to be able to drive them to school the next morning. So, you know, there's trade-offs, but I I think it's really important and so much more so for women. I I see it for men, but more so for women. We have to be ready to change our goals and our practices depending on our seasons of life because we are not going to be doing the same thing, you know, for the all 60 years of our adult life. It's just not going to happen. So you brought up a great point the other day on uh, Twitter slash X. (laughs) We'll figure out what to call it eventually. And when you ask like the biggest hurdles, uh, what was the biggest hurdles for authors? Mm -hmm. Um, I had mentioned consistency because that was something that I have tried to fit into my routine a little bit better with like all the schools and the appointments, podcast stuff, and, you know, just daily work stuff, you know, like the nine to five. In turn, you kind of spoke about your chronic illness and creating cushion in your schedule. What is the best way that you found to like create some kind of cushion? for your goals? And and should we also work that into our goals? I think you have to, again, taking into account who you are, because my body does not operate like your body does and vice versa, right? Mm. So it, it, it could be season of life. You know, I, as a young woman, from the time I was 17 till I was 26 and had a total hysterectomy, I had PMS in a, they now call it PMDD. I mean, it was so beyond PMS, mm. but they didn't even have a diagnosis for it then. And I couldn't function that month. Um, so my husband figured out before I did, we were married young and he would mark it on the calendar and he would refuse any uh, invitations to go out to dinner. He would refuse any overtime work because he knew I was not functioning and I could not be around people that week. Um, so, you know, even as young women, we have things, it could be pregnancy, it could be sick children, it could be whatever. Then, you know, if you have uh, neurodivergent issues, whatever that might look like, if you have somebody in your family with neurodivergence or mental illness or chronic illness or invisible disabilities or full-fledged disabilities, I mean, you have to take all that into account. Now, with the chronic illnesses, the thing that took me so long to wrap my head around it is uh, when I felt good, I would volunteer for things. I would take on jobs. I would take on clients. And then the sad thing was when I didn't feel good is when I had to do the work, right? Mm -hmm. So that was really challenging. The biggest tool, and and it's a pain in the butt. I'm going to tell you ahead. Everybody's going to go, no, I don't want to do that. Um, But the (laughs) best thing I ever did was commit to a month of time tracking, like in five minute increments, I wrote down everything from when I went to the bathroom to what I ate, when I sat down for meals, when I hurt, what hurt. Um, Cause there's some days I felt like crap, but my brain was still, you know, working. My body hurt, but my brain was fine. Other days I deal with chronic migraines. So my brain was useless, but my body was okay. Um, and I documented everything for 30 days and what I learned from that was exactly how much margin I needed and how much I could actually realistically do. And it also showed me how long it took me to do tasks because some things that when I'm healthy, I can do in 10 minutes when I'm not healthy might take me two hours. So, you know, figuring out that basic time management, then going forward allows me to redo and commit. I use toggle as my time tracker and I put everything in toggle now as it goes hours though. You know, if I'm sitting down creating social media posts for a client, I'm working only for that client and my toggle is running so I can see exactly how long it took me to do that task. Uh, Because what I found was there is something in all of our brains, not just mine. I deal with time blindness, but 
all of us to some degree assume that tasks take longer or shorter than we think. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of us have had the experience. We've done two years of begging our husband to do this task that when they finally did it, it took them five minutes. And you're like, really? Really? <laughs> I griped for two years for you to do something for five minutes because we don't understand how long a task takes. So once you start documenting it and you have it in writing that this task in a good week takes this long, the same task in a bad week takes a different length of time. Now I can come up with a realistic calendar schedule and budget my time. And also it tells me, can I take on more clients or can I not take on my, more clients? You, you mentioned like the time tracking, because I know sometimes I'll procrastinate about something mm -hmm. and I'll just put it off and put it off when it could have been, like you said, five minutes. Right, right. But, but it also depends too on what I'm, what I'm going into. Like you said, the time tracking, like, like our conversation, I know just kind of free flows and we mm -hmm. always come up with great points. Like, and, and so I kind of come up with an outline, but we don't really need too much. But if I need to deep dive research into a new guest and someone I haven't personally handpicked usually right. to be on the podcast and kind of reached out, I usually have to allot myself some of that time to kind of exactly. dig into it. So exactly. Yeah. So you and I have known each other for years, so we can oh, yeah. pick up and, and run with no problem. But even even podcast interviews I've done for authors that I followed for years, I want to make sure my information is current and I mm -hmm. want to make sure what I think I know is reality. Um, so I, I still allow myself two to three hours of research time uh, before every podcast guest. And I've had a lot of compliments about from my guests saying, boy, you've been stalking me on social media all those years. And I'm like, no, I just did a really thorough deep dive on my research because I don't want to ask. Um, this is me um, for for my podcast. I don't want to be asking guests things that people can Google. Right. If you can Google yes. it, I don't want to waste your time asking you that kind of thing. I want and and I think this is going to be more important as AI is taking over. Right. Yes. So AI will only share. And, and this is another thing I'm passionate about. So feel free to cut me off. But AI can only share what's been out on the Internet, what it's been trained on. And the information is over two years old. So what we're finding is a lot of people that are using AI to write emails, to write social media posts, to write blog posts, to write, you know, all these things. It's becoming very generic. It's becoming very watered down. And we can Google that information, right? Mm -hmm. I want to focus on creating new thoughts, creating new content, creating new things that AI has not considered yet because it's never been out there. And to do that, we need time to think, we need time to research, and we need time to be creative. And so that has to go into our calendar as well. That we do have to leave that time to be creative or figure that piece out that works for us, like that kind of that recharge. Yes. That's kind of what I do. I, I actually, what I do is I'll research my, and that's how I know who's a fit for the podcast. Mm -hmm. I'll research my, um, the guest and I'll usually try to look up like, like you kind of do the social media, but I'll also look up, have they done interviews before? And what did, what did they cover? Because I don't want to retread territory. I want to exactly. talk about something new and kind of reframe it in a different way. Exactly. I'm, I'm exactly the same way, Sarah. If, uh, if I'm just copycatting what somebody else has done, that's a disservice to my audience and a waste of my time. Why I can just listen to that other podcast. I don't need to spend time creating something new. And so, and I think that's all, that's what we always trying to do. I think as creatives, we're always trying to take like maybe what everyone else has done and put our own spin on it. Right. Because there is nothing new under the sun. No. But, but what is new is pulling the connections. Right. Exactly. I had a student um, who was brilliant years ago and he was so bored with the assignments that I was the department was requiring me to give him. Mm -hmm. So uh, with his mother's permission, he had been reading um, the the satanic Bible. And he, he was a Christian, mm. but he wanted to know what the other side thought. Right. Mm. And um, but the class was reading um, Paul Bunyan, of all things. And this is in the public school. And mm. so he came up to me. His name was Jack. And Jack came up to me and he said, I read that as you know, when I was in elementary school, do I really have to read it again? 
And I said, well, what are you currently reading? And he told me, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And I said, okay, so this is public school. You're 17. So you're right on the line of adult, not adult. Uh, can I have a conference with your mom real quick? I think I have a solution. And he, he called up his mom on, on the school phone and handed it to me. And I asked him to write, to do a research project and do a comparison analysis of Paul Bunyan's and, and the Satanic Bible. And he came up with the most amazing paper I have ever read. Now, Ooh. who would have put those together? Right. He came mm -hmm. up with unique work because he took two very disparate topics and looked for points of commonality and points of divergence and the conclusions he came to and the research that came out of those thoughts was just brilliant. So I think that's something that AI can't do, but I think it behooves us to be wide read and to live life and have good experiences as creatives and lots of experiences so that we have things to draw on to come up with those new connections. You talk about goal setting, like you could set yourself up for a really crazy goal and you might just achieve it, right? Like you said, right. this really big goal of him trying to compare these two very different types of literatures. And you said like you come up with the most, one of the most brilliant things you've ever read, like from it, from a, from one of your students. That's amazing. And, and this was not something that the typical student could do, but I was really fortunate. I had been a gifted and talented kid myself back in the seventies when they first started pulling us out into separate classes. And, um, I was very much challenged by my teachers in Wisconsin and I was allowed to follow some of those curiosity things that a lot of our students, having taught in Texas, we don't allow our students a lot of that freedom mm -hmm. to follow their curiosity. And I think that's a disservice. But I think as authors, especially, we have to follow where our curiosity takes us and we have to come up with those new connections and we have to have a way to process that information, which is why Evernote so important. Personal manage, personal knowledge management now is a big field and it's something I'm really interested in. How do we um, capture the information? How do we organize it? How do we distill it? And how do we express it as something new and unique? Um, these are things, if you want to learn more about Tiago Forte, uh, wrote a, a book called The Second Brain, Building a Second Brain. And he's got a new book coming out called The Para Method, if anyone's interested in personal knowledge management, because I think that goes hand in hand with what we do as creatives, whatever our creative gift is. Well, and you have given so many awesome resources and so many great things as far as like what we can do to reassess our goals and how to think about it mm -hmm. in a more clear and distinct way that is relates to our identity. Mm -hmm. So where can listeners find you? Um, how can they find your podcast and how can they connect? I am on all the social medias, but, but. Um, because we do have only so many hours a day, as we've talked about, I am most active on what used to be Twitter, maybe it's still Twitter, I don't know what to call it either. Um, Instagram and LinkedIn is where you will find me mostly. Uh, I also, and if you go to any of those spots, at Catherine McClatchy, on Twitter, I am at KM McClatchy. And if you will go to the link in the bio, it will give you all my other links and where to find me. Thanks so much to Catherine for joining the show. If you like this kind of content, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. That way you're the first to hear new episodes when they drop. And if you get a chance, feel free to leave a review. It helps support the show and allows more opportunity to bring in all kinds of fantastic guests. Book recommendations for this episode, Atomic Habits by James Clear and Building a Second Brain by Diego Forte. As always, stay safe, be well, and keep writing.